Welcome, beautiful people. Thank you for being here. For many of you, you're on your lunch break, and we're grateful for your time and your energy. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Che Johnson Long. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm going to be starting us with a little bit of grounding and land acknowledgement. Um, as we begin today's session, we know that the fight to end police violence is intrinsically entwined with the fight for indigenous sovereignty. Um, in many ways, they are part of the same fight. And so we acknowledge the Cherokee and the Creek tribes who have stewarded this land traditionally. Um, we also acknowledge the enslaved Africans who were forced to work this land. Um, and, you know, we acknowledge that this is only the beginning of making sure that our fight to end the police state, to end police brutality and police violence um, is very much in line with the fight to return this land to the rightful caretakers, indigenous people. Appreciation to Che for grounding us um, and that video for grounding us in some of the historical context of this moment. Welcome, my name is Shannon Cochran Gajero. I'm here today in my capacity as a board um, co-chair of Solidaire Network. Uh, Solidaire Network is a donor organization made up of individuals and, and institutions that support organizations and organizers, much like who's on the call today, folks um, working and building towards Black liberation, climate justice, indigenous land back movements, and more. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, I'm here to welcome you. You are all welcome if you are brand new to the struggle against Cop City. You're welcome if you've been um, part of this fight from its inception. You're welcome if you are local to Atlanta and you are welcome if you are calling in from elsewhere. Um, we so appreciate you being on your lunch hour with us. Um, today's purpose and goal is really to learn. It's a teach-in. We are so incredibly blessed to be joined by some of Atlanta's most principled and fierce organizers who have been part of what is a decentralized movement to stop Cop City, but um, they have agreed to be with us. And so my invitation to myself and all of you is as much as possible, take care of yourself, eat that lunch, but be engaged and um, present because this is a wonderful opportunity. There are um, many more opportunities to engage down the line and we will hit that. But um, today we are here, we are together and we are so um, incredibly lucky to be joined by Micah Herskind and Tiffany Roberts from Southern Center for Human Rights, E.R. Anderson from Keras Books and Kamal Franklin from Community Movement Builders. And so with that, I will pass it over to Micah. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you everyone um, for being here. My job is to kick us off essentially with some of the, the background and history um, of basically how the proposal known as Cop City um, went through. And there is so much information to share um, and we're really gonna just graze the surface. And so I know that we'll be sharing some resources um, and I would encourage folks to um, dig into those more in order to get the full story. Um, but I'm going to jump right in. Um, and I wanna start by just sort of setting the scene a little bit. Um, so think back to step, but think back to the summer of 2021. Um, think about where you were, what you were doing. Um, during that summer um, was really when this entire movement started. So in September 2021, the Atlanta City Council voted yes on a plan um, to basically destroy 85 acres of Atlanta's South River Forest, also known as the Waylani Forest. Um, land that, as you can see um, on, on this map, um, with the sites that are proposed to go um, where this forest land is. This is land that was originally stolen from Muscogee Creek people in the 1800s. Um, it was home to the old Atlanta prison farm in the 1900s where black laborers were incarcerated and forced to work for the city. Um, and the Atlanta Community Press Collective has done some amazing work documenting that. Um, this land, as you heard from Jackie Eccles um, in that video, is also part um, of a majority black area of DeKalb County. Um, and so the proposal that the Atlanta City Council voted on and approved um, is what's come to be known as Cop City. Um, and the reason why is that the proposal was basically to destroy a bunch of this forest land and replace it with a massive police training facility. Um, you can see on this, um, on this map some of the sites 
that would go um, in this cop city. And the reason it took on the name cop city by organizers was that it literally will include, it, it includes plans for a mock city. So um, it's gonna have um, residential, school, nightlife areas, a bank, a gas station, a shooting range. Um, that's, that's what the proposal is. Um, and as many folks have referred to it as, it's really an urban warfare training facility. That's really what the plan is. Um, so in response to this, this proposal that came out, there was you know, massive resistance right away. A whole range of, of community members, organizations, um, you know, people of goodwill, neighborhoods came out immediately, all the way down to um, local preschools. The, the picture in the bottom corner is from a march that um, a bunch of preschoolers held. And you can see um, it says, I love you trees, stop, never cut down the trees. Um, Folks did direct actions, they circulated petitions, they protested outside of council members' houses, they canvassed neighborhoods, um, there was national attention brought in, um, and there was, you know, there were even neighborhood associations who were closest to this site in Atlanta who were putting out resolutions sort of denouncing this facility. Um, and even though, you know, there's been some attempts to change the narrative around whether or not there was local opposition to this, um, this, this screenshot here, um, is from an AJC article in 2021 where the Atlanta mayor actually acknowledges that there was um, widespread opposition at the time to this facility. So, you know, everyone really knew that there was a lot of local opposition to this, um, this proposal. There were abolitionists involved, environmental justice organizers, groups working against gentrification, mutual aid groups, youth organizers, you know, just this really broad range of people who overwhelmingly said no. Um, and when it came time for the vote um, in September 2021, organizers mobiled, uh, mobilized people for over 17 hours of public comment. So people were calling into city council um, and voicing their opposition. There were about 1,100 callers. 70% um, of those were against Cop City with about 30% um, in favor. Um, if you listen to those calls, as I did with a bunch of other folks, and we sort of tallied up um, who was calling from where, what was their justification, that 30% of folks who were in support of Cop City um, were cops, firefighters, and Buckhead residents. That was who was calling in and saying, I'm a, you know, I live in Buckhead and you need to build Cop City. So that was really like the other side. Meanwhile, that 70% was people saying, hey, I live near the site, I live anywhere in Atlanta, and I'm concerned about policing, I'm concerned about the environment, you know, this, this broad range of concerns. Um, Despite all of that opposition, despite you know such clear community outrage, um, when it came time to vote, you can see the breakdown of the votes. This was the, the old council. There's been some new folks elected since. Um, there was almost no discussion of that 17 hours um, and council voted yes on it with only four votes in opposition. And so, um, you know, I think there's a question that probably many folks might have of like, how does this happen? You know, if we live in a, a democracy where, where you know, our, our representatives are supposed to, you know, pay attention to our voices, I think we'd all like to believe that if all these organizations, all these neighborhoods, all these community members come out against something, um, that, you know, that would at least give reason for, you know, a pause or reconsideration or really slowing it down. Um, instead, what we saw was that a really powerful mix of actors, including media, corporations, um, state actors, the police, really acted together to push this proposal through. Um, and there's so much to this story, but I want to just um, give a couple examples. Um, so I'm going to start with the media, actually. So um, this entire, you know, like I said, this proposal for Cop City actually came before the city council the full city council first in mid-August of 2021. Um, and it had been going through some council committees at that point, sort of it's working with working its way through the process. People were calling in at every stage of this process. Um, and despite opposition, a lot of folks expected the proposal to be approved in that August 2021 meeting. Because of the opposition, um, it actually did get delayed. Um, and right after that delay, the day after council voted to just delay it for two weeks, um, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, our main paper here in Atlanta, if you're in Atlanta, you know all too well, um, came out with this editorial from the editorial board that said, crime wave should spur action on the center. Um, they wrote, uh, crime is not going to politely observe this delay. Criminals are going to apply their trade. Um, it's going to, you know, take a cost in property, public fears, and even lives. It's really sort of extreme language. Um, they say it's no exaggeration to say that better trained officers, you know, might save lives. 
And of course they say that despite, you know, a lot of evidence that I think we'll get into later that training has not been effective in stopping police violence. Um, the, the Atlanta police officer who murdered Rayshard Brooks had over 2000 hours of training um, and that didn't stop him from taking somebody's life. This was far from the first time that the AJC published um, in support of building Cop City. So here are a couple examples of headlines. Um, and when you look at who wrote these pieces, we have a former Atlanta police chief, the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation, um, the CEO of Louder Milk Companies and a board chair of the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, and while all of this is happening and still to date, the AJC has published no articles um, voicing opposition to Cop City. Um, you know, no op-eds, nothing like that. And so we know that this coverage was really one-sided um, and that, you know, the AJC seems to have some interest in, in this project. Um, and, you know, we can ask, why is that coverage? One possible answer um, is that if you look at, um, that we can sort of get to, is if you look at an omission in that editorial piece back from August, um, you can see in the top left corner here, this was a disclaimer that was added later um, that Cox Enterprises CEO Alex Taylor um, is leading a campaign to raise private funds for the Cop City Project, $60 million in private money. Um, and Cox Enterprises happens to own the AJC. Um, and so, you know, I think everyone can put two and two together that the owner of our main outlet here in Atlanta that, you know, helps inform a lot of people about what's going on has a direct stake in seeing this, um, in seeing Cop City built. They're actively fundraising for it. Um, like I said, Alex Taylor is also the was the chair of the Atlanta Committee for Progress, um, and that is this sort of public-private partnership that has a lot of corporations on its board, a lot of corporate backers. We don't even have time to get into them. Um, and the, so the other actor that I actually want to talk about um, is the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, there's a really good report out from Little Sis about the Police Foundation. Essentially, they are these private nonprofit entities that often act as sort of the funding arm for police departments in various cities. They bring in a lot of technology, a lot of money. Um, and much like ACP, the Atlanta Committee for Progress, you'll see here, um, they have a lot of the same backers. They have a lot of corporations on their board. They receive a lot of money from a lot of Atlanta-based corporations. Um, and so the Atlanta Police Foundation is one of really the main actors to know about in this story. Um, and they had in fact been working on Cop City um, since at least 2017, when they actually first proposed um, the South River Forest as a site. Um, and it, but, it, but it wasn't until 2021 when this was announced. Um, APF played a really big role in lobbying the council and the mayor's office to push through this proposal. Um, and I wanna zoom in quickly um, on a date in June, 2021, um, when the legislation was going to go in front of the finance committee of the city council. So any legislation has to go through committees before it can be voted on by the full council. Um, and so on June 13th, before this finance committee meeting, um, we, got these, we got these emails through open records requests. Um, on June 13th, the CEO of the Atlanta Police Foundation, Dave Wilkinson, sent an email to John Keane, who was sort of a, a guy who's pretty high up in the mayor's office. Um, and who was a real key partner in pushing this plan through. Um, and in it, he says, um, he references an email that he's attaching from a really prominent CEO. We don't know who the CEO is. Um, he highlights that this CEO has worked on the Atlanta Committee for Progress, um, and that he's really frustrated about the crime surge and thinks that not enough is being done. Um, he says he knows from a previous conversation with the mayor's um, sort of right-hand man, John Keane, um, that city council members are looking for a cover. So this sort of comes back again to the idea that they knew that the local community was really against it. Um, and um, so, yes, yeah, so, so, you know, acknowledging this fact. But he says, you know, you shouldn't give in on this just because some environmentalists don't want this thing. You know, you better push it through. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm going so fast just for the sake of time. Um, and then he attaches this email from this anonymous CEO who lives in Buckhead. Uh, the CEO is angry about the shootings, the parties in the streets, the water boys. Um, and he includes this line where he says, the current situation must stop ASAP or I and others will have to turn all of our support toward the Buckhead cityhood movement. And so if you're in Atlanta, you know about the Buckhead cityhood movement. It's essentially a secession movement where um, the white wealthy Buckhead wanted to secede from the city of Atlanta, take, um, you know, take all of its tax base with it. It's about 40% of the city's tax base. 
it's really this modern day sort of white flight movement. Um, and so you can see here just the window into how the community is really against this thing, but the corporate forces of Atlanta are lining up behind it and saying, hey, if you want your tax base, you better push this thing through. It doesn't matter that people are against it. This is what we want. Um, and so there's so much more to this story. Um, I want to leave space for everyone else to talk about. So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna wrap it up here. But I just want to be clear that since you know since that legislation was passed in September 2021 and the facility was approved, um, the secrecy and the lack of transparency has really continued. Um, and so you might have heard the recent announcement that um, they will be that they're planning to move forward with the destruction of the forest, that they got the permits, um, and that they've taken this feedback from this community advisory um, committee. And I'm just including some of these headlines. There's been some rare critical coverage of this community advisory process. Um, and I'm just gonna highlight um, a couple of that. Ooh. Am I still sharing screen? Yeah, okay, great. Um, you know, it's had transparency concerns. A member who, um, you know, raised some, some public concerns about how the committee work was playing out was removed from the committee. Um, there's been various ethics um, issues that have come up. And so all of this is to say, um, you know, everything about this process has proceeded behind closed doors. It has not included the people of Atlanta. Um, it's totally disregarded people's voices. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, you know, in some ways reason enough to care about this. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. Again, I would encourage you all to you know read many of the resources that have been written about how this thing happened. Um, but just you know, I hope that you will take away that there was loud vocal opposition from the start. The city knew it. We knew it. The city knew that we knew it. Um, and they really pushed it through anyway because those were the orders that they got from people who have a lot of money and a lot of power. Thank you, Micah, for that um, framing. And yes, I know it was fast, but um, this is being recorded. I just want to name that for folks that are worried, and it will be posted um, on Karis's YouTube channel um, so we can go back and revisit things again, and there will be resources sent out. So I'm going to kick it over to uh, you, Tiffany, and Kamal to just kind of expand on um, anything that you want to share, but also kind of the broader connections to increase militarization of, of police um, and some of the community activism um, that y'all have been part of on the ground. You're muted, Tiffany, and I did it too. <laughs> I had gone all 2023. Okay, um, just saying thank you and um, wanting to hand it over to Kamal to share uh, a bit about the intersections between um, community movement builders work here in Atlanta and Cop City. So the work on Cop City, but also um, the anti-gentrification work um, that seeks to empower or to flank indigenous Black residents in the city of Atlanta. Um, so Kamal, I'll just hand it over to you to share a bit more. Cool. Thank you so much. And thank y'all for having me. Uh, and I'll be brief. Uh, so we as community movement builders have been organizing in Atlanta, particularly the Pittsburgh community in Southwest Atlanta since about 2015. And we held some initial town halls to discuss with uh, folks in the community, what it is that they wanted to see happen in their community. Uh, uh, Pittsburgh is a working class, poor black community, uh, one that's been intact since the 1800s, started by uh, freed uh, Africans or formerly enslaved Africans. Uh, and it's been through a lot, right? It's been through a process of not only when there was desegregation and folks moved out, but also the Great Recession when people lost their homes and properties. And so what's been happening since that time period is that massive gentrification, not only in that area, but it's been taking over all of Atlanta, um, but is now particularly centered in that community. And so we've been doing a lot of work around that. That ties closely together with the idea of the militarization and the overuse and over-policing of black and brown communities, because it is the police who have been used as the, the, the soldiers, literally, to go inside communities like this 
um, and to use tactics uh, as tactics we've seen in Memphis, as tactics we've had here with the Red Dog squad and some other squads, uh, excuse me, but these, these tactics are done by uh, uh, cops who are basically uh, chasing people down, stopping them on the street, doing illegal searches, harassing people, arresting people, all under the guise that they're stopping crime or are all under the guise that they're looking for guns or they're looking for drugs. And what they're really doing is harassing the community, uh, pushing people out, pushing people around. So now people are not, are not only worried about the fact that there's increases in rent, the fact that their home, uh, uh, their home mortgages are going up or they can't afford to continue to pay their mortgages or their taxes are going up and people are losing properties, they're now being harassed by the police in their neighborhoods and in their communities. And this is not an accidental tactic or strategy. This is something that's taking place all across the country. New York has had squads like this. Memphis, uh, as we've talked about just now, has squads like this. So this type of policing is part and parcel to hope, helping to support gentrification. Um, we got really involved in doing uh, or countering police violence after Rashad Brooks was killed by the police. Uh, in a Wendy's that's less than a mile away from the community house that we have. And we worked with the family of, of Rashad Books to try to see if we can have the Wendy's turned into a community center of some kind. That proved unsuccessful because of the mayor's attitude. This was part of the 2020 uprisings in Atlanta, um, uh, but it happened all over the country and even internationally after George Floyd was killed, Breonna Taylor and several others. The response of the city to this uprising was Cop City. Um, Cop City, which may have been in the plans prior, but only really took shape and form. It became this thing that they all of a sudden needed to have was after that there was movement and, and organizing in the streets of Atlanta. Um, and they even couched it as a couple of things, like the, the mayor of the, at the time, uh, uh, Bottoms, couched it as uh, we are building Cop City to improve the morale of police officers. And then they also couched it as we want to fight crime. Even if there was no facility being built, I mean, even if there was no protest against this facility being built, it would take three to five years at its best to completely build a facility like this. This facility has nothing to do with crime, but all about the continuing repression of movements and organizations as they challenge police violence and the repression of poor and working class communities that Atlanta under its black mayoral leadership over 40 or 50 years has continued to push out of Atlanta. We've now reached a stage that the so-called black Mecca has gone from over 60% black to under 50% black, all under the leadership of black mayors like Andre Dickens and city council folks. And so what we see here is no accident that the black political elite is tied to the corporate, mostly, but not exclusively white elite. And their goal is to make Atlanta a playground for corporations to come here. Corporations are not called outsiders when they come to Atlanta and they settle here. Corporations are not called outsiders when they bring their employees here and they drive up the prices of housing uh, and rents and the rest of it. Those folks are welcomed who are not welcomed are the poor and working class people and particularly the poor working class black folks who kept Atlanta going uh, through decades and decades and decades and decades. Those are the people that are being pushed out. The police are a leading edge of pushing them out. Cop City will only expedite that because that will be the role that those police play in addition to making sure that they continue to shut down organizing and movements against police violence and other issues of concern here in Atlanta. Thank you, Kamal. And I will um, only add that um, there, the question keeps coming up, well, don't we want police to be trained? Um, and the, the response is what people want is to feel secure and safe where they live. They want to raise their children uh, in environments where they are not in apprehension of violence from police. People want the money that they need to, to secure their families, right? They want their children to be educated. And what we know is that policing in its form, in, in the way that we experience it in this country interrupts 
right? It interrupts and it prevents people who are Black, who are Brown, who are poor from actualizing many of those aspirations, especially um, in cities that are hell-bent on depending and relying almost entirely on policing. What we know about police training and police militarization is that they do not, in fact, make communities safe. Even when the city talks about wanting to include um, diversity and inclusion and implicit bias trainings, even those trainings, um, especially the DEI and, um, and, and bias trainings, if they have any impact at all, it's only documented it as being a very brief impact. In 2020, Mayor Bottoms stood up a use of force advisory council. It was one of the recommendations that former President Obama issued to many mayors across the city. Um, and I was the co-chair of that committee. And as a part of our work, we wanted to be super clear uh, that we did not want this to be just a, a, an, amp an amplification of eight can't wait demands. Um, in fact, when we talk about the eight can't wait campaign, Atlanta has implemented six of the eight and, and police violence continued to increase on an annual basis. Uh, what we know is that we have to limit um, and in many cases eliminate contact between police and um, the community that when there is less uh, contact between police and the community, fewer incidents of force occur. That is, a, that is a fact. And so many of the policy recommendations that the Bottoms administration and the Dickens administration have received from the community um, directly implicate the contact between police and the community, meaning eliminating APD's quota, um, system, um, investing heavily in policing alternatives and diversion initiative, which allows non-law enforcement actors to report to scenes when people are in crisis, investing in the things that make it more likely that people feel safe in their homes, uh, comfortable with the way that their children are educated, comfortable with the route that their children are walking to get to school, right? Um, Police are not the answer. And so um, despite Mayor Dickens repeatedly saying, isn't that what people asked for in 2020? Um, not only is that absolutely false, the evidence to the contrary is in writing. And some of the evidence to the contrary is in writing in the city's own documentation. And so we'll share those links. We encourage you all um, to push back against the notion that um, the training of policing somehow shifts the culture of policing. The culture of, of policing in our country um, is that it, it posits police as warriors and it posits community members as enemy combatants. It, it, it causes the agencies that enforce the law to engage many people um, using the same rules of engagement that people use in war. And what we know that means is that's isolation, um, that's a lot of bloodshed, and it doesn't build up communities in ways that we find helpful. Um, and now, Shannon, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted us to share on that. No, thank, thank you so much. I'm unmuted, correct? Okay. Um, no, that, that's great um, and adds additional layers. Um, do either or does anybody feel moved to add anything else as you've been listening to, to folks talk? Um, because otherwise, you know, we got thank you to folks that submitted some questions and I've been monitoring um, things that have been coming in today and I could um, just start fielding some of the, the ones that I'm seeing. Um, seem top of mind for folks? Does that seem good? Shannon, I see yeah. the question about connecting to close the jail, and I do think that's important. Michael, did you want to start that off? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's such an important point. So to contextualize sort of further in Atlanta for folks, um, Cop City, the movement to stop Cop City is far from the only um, pain point right now or the point of movement. And of course, all these struggles are connected. But you know, to sort of set the scene in Atlanta more broadly, anyone who's here knows that one of our main crisis center hospitals, Wellstar Atlanta Medical Center, just shut down last year because of inadequate funding. Um, and, you know, it was not saved by either the city or the county. Um, at the same time, last year, the city of Atlanta reopened um, a mostly empty city jail that's downtown called the Atlanta City Detention Center. Um, and at the same time, just within the last two weeks, plans were announced in Fulton County 
um, a proposal to build a new $2 billion jail. Um, and so as we're talking about top city, we can't just talk about, you know, the expansion of policing. We also just talk about the expansion of, of jailing and also the undercutting of public services, of crucial things that actually keep people safe, like hospitals that are being closed while jails are being opened and expanded. And so, you know, it's, I think within all of this, we have to take into account the broader ecosystem um, of the direction the city is going. And we should, we should be cognizant of how that links to other things happening in the city. So um, oftentimes when big events come to cities, um, that coincides with an expansion of policing. So during the 1996 Olympics, the city of Atlanta actually built the Atlanta City Detention Center, which is this 1300 bed jail in the heart of downtown, this big ugly building that cages people. Um, and they built that in order to clear people off the streets in preparation for visitors in the Olympics. And now Atlanta is trying to host the, um, the 2026 FIFA World Cup. They're trying to get the Democratic National Convention to come to Atlanta. Um, and so we should connect all of those things as well to this expansion of policing and jailing as they try to really lock down the city and make it look safe for corporate investment and for big events and big tourists coming in. Really quickly, I just wanted to add, and with that, it, again, it, it was uh, during the Olympics that Atlanta decided to begin uh, destroying and ending all of its public housing, right? Uh, and so all of the public housing, there's no more public housing in Atlanta. There's a voucher system, which is a broken system. One, because landlords are not even required to take the vouchers. Um, so this system, and, and there's not a one-for-one, one, there was never a one-for-one one replacement uh, of, of affordable housing for what was torn down. So this is really, really important to show that it continually, again, continually, Atlanta has done everything it can to push poor and working class people outside of Atlanta and claim it has no money, right? But at the same time, without anyone asking, Atlanta put $30 million into building Cop City. No questions around where the money is coming from. No questions about can be afforded. No questions about is that the best use of it. They decided on their own, city officials, uh, with their corporate sponsors, to put $30 million of the city's money into building Cop City. And then they had to be pushed to put money into the affordable housing plan or uh, housing uh, resources, I think about $8 million. They had to be pushed to put that in there. Um, but the $30 million for Cop City, they willingly gave without a question, issue, and or iota. Um, I, so, and I, I want to add, um, if you want to track the recommendations that the city has rejected, um, we can share the links of the different task forces that were, were uh, staffed by community members recommending um, non-carceral responses to harm, recommending the availability of housing, the availability of direct services, and just, you know, grounding us again in the, there is a human consequence, right? The, the cost of the failure to do these things is actually human lives, right? Sometimes it is uh, the loss of life, like the actual loss of life. We think about the killing of Tortuguita in the forest, and we think about the harm um, that was caused not only to him, but for, for people uh, who called him friends or called them friends um, and called them a member of community. Uh, Kamau and I have a friend named, had a friend named Oscar Kane Jr., he was killed in a forest by an Atlanta Police Department officer in 2019. Uh, to our knowledge, that officer is still on the Atlanta Police Department force, and Oscar was an organizer around police accountability. But the real human cost of the city of Atlanta failing to meaningfully um, invest in projects uh, and in resources that flank the strength of our communities, it's felt and it reverberates for years. Um, the mayor and others were, were quoted this week as saying that Cop City will be a community resource center. And I just want us to be real about this. Who do we know who finds themselves in the crosshairs of the criminal legal system, who feel the militarized police in their communities? Who do we know um, that would be willing to go to a police training facility to, facility to receive any community service? any kind of direct services. As a as criminal defense attorney, I'm sure Kamal can, can um, back me up on this. It is difficult to get clients who feel attacked by the police to go pick up their own police reports. 
The trauma that is visited on Black communities and poor communities and Brown communities cannot be overstated. And so it is particularly um, disturbing to hear this uh, training facility where they will be training police to shoot and kill people, right? So we're talking about having a school when there's no documentation that policing reduces the incidence of police shootings, of mass shootings at police, right? We're talking about having a bar. Well, we don't have any evidence of, of that policing in nightlife areas reduces the chance of chances of violence, right? So there's a difference between a PR campaign and a solid policy campaign. And what we see um, the city of Atlanta doing in partnership with the state's leadership is engaging um, in a PR campaign to make something that is a deadly tool appear to be a community service when it actually isn't. Um, and also people are being targeted through criminal prosecution for what many, in many respects is, an, uh, is a legal exercise of their first amendment right to free speech. Um, Canal, I know that you may have some opinions about um, the way that protesters are being prosecuted for domestic terrorism. And I, we um, know that many people who are being prosecuted are being represented by really capable counsel. And so we'll be careful not to comment on the cases specifically, but that is a question that has been coming up from community members. Yeah, I think it's important for folks to understand that when we talk about the criminalization of organizers and activists, this is exactly what we mean. Uh, since the early days of fighting against Cop City, when we were out in the street protesting, the police would bust open our rallies, our demonstrations. We've had rallies and demonstrations where over 17 people were arrested. Uh, at that time, they were charged with things like disorderly conduct and obstruction of governmental administration. But the people, some folks were pepper sprayed, thrown to the ground. Their handcuffs was put on tight. They were doing things to basically harass and hurt people to show again that they were the bullies on the block, that they were in charge. This was happening early on in the organizing against Cop City. The media did not cover it as police violence against citizens or organizers or activists or protesters. They just said violent protest. But it was the police who were violent since the very beginning. It was after the, the passing of the, of the legislation or the lease being granted by C via city council that folks switched to the idea of including a forest defender's operation, let's say, or folks deciding we're gonna go into the forest and defend outright the fact that these trees are now, this forest is now in danger of being torn down during a climate crisis, right? A forest that was promised for recreational purposes for that neighboring community. The police decided to continue to step up their tactics particularly when it saw that organizers and activists were gaining traction, traction with the media, particularly the national media, not the local media, but the national media in covering the story, that the communities uh, adjacent to the, the force were all overwhelmingly shown to be in support of the, the protesters and against uh, this cop city and against the force being torn down. They started to step up their tactics. Their tactics then started to include a task force, a task force that included the Atlanta Police Department, the DeKalb County Police Department, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and Homeland Security, all for organizers and activists on the ground in trees. The folks who were arrested in the forest, we've had about 15 or 15 arrests in the forest themselves. At the time of their arrest, all of the protesters who were arrested were either at a forest site or camp or in the trees themselves. There is no allegation whatsoever that they were doing anything other than engaging in civil disobedience and or direct action by being in the force. But yet these folks are called criminals and given a charge of domestic terrorism and called outsiders, right? Outside agitators. The same people who tell you two weeks ago to celebrate Dr. King, right, on the holiday are calling organizers and activists outside agitators people who don't belong. These are the words of Southern segregationists. The history of Southern segregationists is to accuse organizers like Dr. King, people from the Freedom Riders, people from the Civil Rights Movement of being outside agitators, right? People who come to work out, to, to fight against oppression, to fight against bad laws, to fight against illegal laws. Those are the things that nowadays these folks are being called and are, are now being charged with in terms of being called domestic terrorists. We've had a total of 19 arrests. 
uh, who are folks who are being charged with domestic terrorism. We think this obviously this statute, which is the first time it's ever been used since it's been enacted, uh, is overbroad on its face. And this use by the, the, the state of Georgia through its right wing Republican governor in allegiance and alliance with its so-called moderate liberal black mayor shows that both city and state officials and federal officials are here to protect the police and not to protect the right to protest or protect the citizens in this city, this state, and in this country. Thank you, Kamal. And I'm just noting that Micah shared for, I know there may be people who are going to um, leave the call a bit early. And so the toolkit, there's a toolkit now in the chat available to everyone. Um, and with that, handing it back over to Shannon. Um, thanks. Um, thanks for all, all the context and, and nuance and layers. Um, I know we could go on for hours and hours, but just kind of collating um, some of what I've seen in the chat and before, but um, could anybody discuss actually the murder of Tort, the forest defender, um, both in what we actually do know and do not know, some of the way that it's being um, spun in the media and used um, by Andre Dickinson's administration to and, and the governor to push forward this project, to call in the National Guard um, last weekend, as well as any you know, response to people that have big feelings about when um, property destruction happens during a, a demonstration. So those two themes have come up um, and it, it would be great if someone could just quickly respond. Um, when it comes to the death of, of Tortuguita, the police have put out a narrative which we completely dispute, uh, which we completely challenge. Um, we think the fact that, again, this task force of Atlanta police, DeKalb County police, Georgia Bureau of Investigations, I've left state troopers, Georgia state troopers, and again, news reports also said the Federal Bureau of Investigation might have been there that day, that this these police went into this forest um, and none of them had any body cameras on. The Atlanta Police Department is required to have its body cameras on when it interacts with the public. The fact that there's so, there's no body camera of the actual shooting, but yet there's supposed to be body camera of prior to the shooting and potentially after the shooting, right? Secondly, from reports that we've heard in the neighborhood, uh, folks said that they heard a sudden round of gunfire, not one shot and then a, a short blip and then, a, and then a return of fire, but a sudden round of gunfire. We find it somewhat inconceivable that an organizer and activist sitting in a cloth tent on the ground would fire a bullet as being surrounded by police, 12, 13, 20, we don't even know how many police officers, that they would shoot at a police officer first, knowing basically they were committing suicide. It just seems disgustingly, a disgusting lie on its face. Right, And the police have not released in other information. They have not released an autopsy. We don't know how many times this young person was hit and what angles they were hit. We don't have any of that information right now. The only information we have is the police version, which is self-serving, which is why we continue to call for an independent investigation of this matter that does not involve city, state, county, or federal authorities, that it has to be something in which the family themselves get to lead and they're filing a wrongful death suit to our knowledge, but they are the ones who need to lead an investigation because it's the only way we're going to get a truly independent investigation. I will say on the idea of property damage, there, the, the, the coalition, let's say, or the loose grouping of different organizers and activists of various ideologies and movement stripes has come together to fight Cop City. Um, even under that banner of fighting Cop City, we are autonomous in our actions and our goals. But to be clear, my individual opinion, I don't have any upsetness, so I'm not upset at a truck being burned or of a Wendy's being burned if it means protecting Black people from being killed by the police. The fact that these, these city council people, the mayor, the newspapers, save their harshest rhetoric for when property is damaged, but call for 
quiet investigation and calm and, 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 and quietness when people are murdered and killed and harassed, to me, shows us what the problem is on its face, right? So we are here to organize. People are putting in different tactics, um, some tactics some folks may not like, but we will not be separated into good activists and bad activists. That is the plan of the city. That is the plan of the police. That is the plan of the corporate news outlets, which support Cop City. They will not separate us as organizers and activists, even as we engage in different strategies and tactics to stop Cop City from happening. And I'll just um, add that when it when it comes to um, the tragic killing of Tortuguita, there needs to be some pressure on the city of Atlanta to explain why it would participate in a raid or an operation that runs afoul of its own um, procedures, its own rules of standing operating procedure. As Kamal mentioned, um, the city of Atlanta has implemented some of the toughest body camera rules in the nation, which is why we don't rely on body cameras as tools of, to, to mitigate police brutality, rather they're a tool of transparency. Um, and if, if the city really believes, right, that those methods are, are critical to ensure that community trust, if that's even possible, why would it participate in a, a multi-jurisdictional or multi-agency uh, tactical operation in the name of building its own training facility that did not adhere to its most basic rules around documentation. Atlanta is one of the most, is the most surveilled city in the nation. And if Mayor Dickens has its way, we will be, we will continue to be so by leaps and bounds. How is it possible that we are not making information available to the community and to the family of this young person who was killed when we know that that documentation is there. Whether it is a, a, um, a microphone that captured the volley of shots on a body camera that was not in the, the, uh, in, the, in the immediate vicinity of the shooting, we know that there is documentation out there. And take a look at how quickly documentation is released when someone is robbed or someone is burgled in the city. As soon as, as soon as the news cycle hits, we've got video of everything that has happened. How is it in this circumstance when a young person has lost their life that the city's lips are sealed and they are arrogantly carrying out business as usual. There has to be some answer for that from the city of Atlanta and from every governmental agency that sent law enforcement to the forest on that day. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you um, for, for sharing and teaching us on this call. I know we're, um, getting to the, to the top of the hour. Um, and so just one thing that, I mean, Kamal said this so, so well, but um, I really do wanna highlight the, the big 10 element of this movement. We have had some questions like, oh, I'm not, I don't define myself as an abolitionist. Is there a space for me in this movement? Um, and I just wanna quickly hear from one of y'all just what you would say about the, the different approaches that, that are happening and how folks can um, find their path to, to getting involved. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly say, um, I think that part of the beauty of this movement has been um, that because Cop City will have you know, such devastating um, impacts on so many different levels, environmental, human rights, racial justice, environmental racism, gentrification, um, you know, the expansion of the police state, and the undermining of you know the social arm of the state. Um, people have come at this from so many different angles. You know it, there are a million reasons to get involved. Um, I think that there are so many abolitionists involved. I'm an abolitionist, um, but that's not all who's involved. And I think all are welcome. And I think the beauty of sort of what it means for this to be an autonomous, decentralized, broad movement is that everyone can find their lane and and plug in. Um, and in that in that toolkit that we shared. Um, there are a bunch of ways for you to take action, whether you are in Atlanta, 
outside of Atlanta, you know, there are a lot of people to contact, call on, you know, the mayor, the city council, the Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, one of the major strategies that sort of floated to the top has been pressuring contractors and subcontractors and saying like, hey, even if Atlanta wants this thing to move forward, you still need contractors to do it. And we can actually put pressure on contractors and say, this is an evil project and you should not participate. Um, there are still protesters sitting in jail. And so you can donate to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund to help get them out um, and to help fund the legal effort. But, you know, there are so many other um, other ways to get involved. If you're in Atlanta, you can join canvassing efforts. There's a you know a place on the toolkit for that. And so um, I think everyone is just encouraged to um, fit in wherever you can. You know, even host, a, host an event, invite some neighbors, invite, you know, your friends, whether you're in Atlanta or not and talk about Cop City with them and you know see what action you can take together. There's really so many ways to plug in. Thank you. And um, ER, I'm gonna send it to you to, to extrapolate on that and send us home. Yeah, I think um, the thing I just wanna help folks pay attention to um, as, a, as Karis is a feminist bookstore um, and popular education space, is that a lot of this is about media literacy. Like I think sometimes folks get it twisted that you have to be um, a certain kind of activist that you have to be in the streets or that you have to um, be really formally trained. And a lot of this uh, is nerdy work, right? Like this is about folks paying attention uh, and just asking questions about some of these narratives that were being fed. Um, and so I just want to lift up like, you know, Micah asked for information, you know, Tiffany and Kamau are paying attention and asking incisive questions and doing a lot of um, careful study. And so I want to say that everyone can do that. You do not need a degree. You do not need to be fancy in any way to do the work that each of us does. And so um, I'm going to share a book list that Karis has put together in the chat. We'll be sending all of this stuff out. We're going to send you a massive packet along with Micah's toolkit and other resources. Um, look, you don't have to have your mind made up about what you think about this before you've read any information. Um, it's really, we don't want you to do that. We want you to read and we want you to think. What the mayor's office is doing right now is sending out propaganda that says facts, 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 right? Um, that's not true, right? Uh, we're trying to we're trying to help you like get some good information. We believe that you deserve that um, as people who live, you know, in, in DeKalb County or in Atlanta, but as people who live throughout the world um, and, and are experiencing policing um, in ways that are increasingly globalized, right, and militarized. So I want to encourage you, if you um, only read one book on this list, there is a great book, No More Police, A Case for Abolition um, by Miriam Kaba and Andrea Ritchie. Even if you think you are not an abolitionist, read this book check it out, see why it might make sense um, and, and go into it with an open mind. This uh, book list has books for children, books for adults. It has a lot of books about the connection to environmental racism, um, to the history of indigenous resistance and organizing to the surveillance state. Because also one fact that um, may have gotten buried is that Atlanta is the most surveilled city in the United States. Um, even if you think you have nothing to hide and you don't care that you're on camera all the time. Uh, that is something that we should all be concerned about. Um, there's a lot of stuff about Atlanta politics and why Atlanta as the city too busy to hate has been um, a corporate tactic since the 1950s, right? And we need to be concerned about that, that that, that being our reputation is not necessarily a good thing. Um, there's so much in here for everyone. We hope you'll check it out. Um, I'll also just say uh, a number of the folks who have been arrested uh, are trans and queer. This is also a trans and queer issue. It is really important for folks to plug in from that perspective as well and to understand um, that this, again, affects so many of our movements in so many different ways. Um, that being said, this is just one uh, you know, information session. There are a ton of actions coming up. There are tons of places you can plug in. So I do just want to shout a few of those out. Folks have already asked about you know, the, the week of action that's coming up. So that is happening very soon. There is also um, the this uh, Sunday, the 5th, a benefit concert for Torts Family and Lodging for Lakota Activists at Walani. Um, park, 5 p.m. Uh, will be a potluck, 7.30, there will be a concert. There's a National Day of Action on February 7th. 
on Saturday, February 11th at 2 p.m. Walani People's Forum will be happening at Park Avenue Baptist Church, which is in like Grant Park area. There's so much more happening. One of the things that you can do is follow folks online, Instagram. Obviously, not everybody's putting all their business online, but there are some public um places like Stop Cop City, Defend the Atlanta Forest, the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, and of course, Community Movement Builders um, and the Southern Center for Human Rights and Karis, um, Karis Books and More is our Instagram handle. So we encourage you to check all of those things out to get good, reliable information. I think that's it, Shannon. Thanks. Thank y'all. I know we could do this for another hour, but um, thank you for being here. Thanks to Kamau, to Tiffany, to Micah, to ER, to all of you that tuned in, and we wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, everybody.